Kia and welcome to lecture two of week three. Today we're going to be looking at uh, more examples of differential equations, some linear differential equations and some nonlinear differential equations. But the new thing is they're going to apply to some real world situations. So these are examples of applications of differential equations. The linear example is going to be Newton's law of cooling and warming. And again, you may have seen this example uh, already. 16101 calculus for example but it's no bad thing to see it again so what did Newton discover about how things uh, warm up and cool down <laughs> heat is a famously complicated physical phenomenon and to get the whole understanding of it uh, worked out uh, it really took uh, hundreds of years but the genius here of Newton was he managed to slice through all the difficulties and get the main part of it so we're going to take an object so often when I'm thinking about this, uh, think about a hot cup of coffee, so I'll just draw one there. Here's my coffee, cup of coffee. And the outside temperature here is at a fixed temperature, and I'm going to call that Tm. So it's the fixed temperature outside. But in there, the temperature is changing. And the idea is if the temperature of the coffee is hotter than the outside temperature, the coffee will cool down. And the crucial thing is that the rate of change of temperature is proportional to the temperature difference. Which sort of makes sense initially, because if the temperature was equal to the outside temperature, no temperature difference, then it wouldn't heat up or cool down. If you've got a big temperature difference, you cool down more quickly. And the rate of cooling is going to be proportional to the temperature difference. If the temperature of your object is less than the ambient temperature, so you, you took a cup of ice cold coffee and put it in a warm room and then it would warm up, then uh, dt dt would be positive. Now it's traditional to use t for temperature, so I have to say d big t, d little t, the rate of change of temperature with respect to time. Now why is, uh, well first off, what is k, this constant of proportionality, and why is it negative? Well, it's negative because uh, if T minus Tm is positive, that means you're hotter than your environment, then you should cool down, which means you need a negative sign on the right. That makes K negative. And if you're colder than your environment, T minus Tm is negative. Multiply it by a negative number, you'd get a positive number, and you would heat up. So that's physically consistent to have K negative. You can also write it the other way around, have Tm minus T, and then K would be positive. But what is K? Well, it's very hard to compute the value of K from first principles because it depends on every other aspect of the situation. Basically, it depends on the materials and the interface. And the way I think about this is if you're heating up a pizza in the oven, um, the pizza's, let's say you've got the oven on 200 degrees, 10 minutes or something, you take it out. Now the, the metal tray the pizza's sitting on is at 200 degrees, and the pizza crust is also at 200 degrees. But if you touch the metal tray, it will be transferred from the metal tray to your finger very, very quickly. That would be a very large value of K. But if you touch the pie crust, heat would be you wouldn't get burned, and the heat would be transferring from the pie crust to your finger very slowly, that would be a small value of K. So it depends precisely on the insulation properties of the materials and how fast heat can flow between them. So that's the very complicated part, is working out K. And the genius of this differential equation is you don't need to know it. You can get the change in the temperature with time uh, just, from this, uh, just from Newton's law. So we're going to solve this differential equation. Let's uh, copy it down. T big T, T little t equals K, T minus T M. I'll also need a starting value. So let's say T at time 0 equals T0. OK, so this is uh, separable. So I need to divide by the entire right-hand side here to get uh, all the T's on the left. So I get 1 over T minus T M. And I'm leaving the little K on the right-hand side there. I can move the dt over there, integrate both sides. 
This one is easy, that's kt plus c. Okay, it's just a constant. Now to integrate the left here, I could make a substitution. I could make u equals t minus tm, or I could just uh, go away and work that out separately, and it comes out to be log of the absolute value of t minus tm is equal to kt plus c. So that's the implicit solution. Now, I might like to uh, solve for the temperature, so let's take uh, E of both sides. Now I'm going to rewrite that right-hand side as using properties of exponentials. And I'm going to call E to the C, I'm going to call that a constant A. Just changing the name of my constant of integration there. Get rid of, uh, get rid of the absolute values. That means the right-hand side must be plus or minus a e to the kt. Well, I didn't tell you what the value of a was yet. That's just any constant. So the plus or minus will just change it to be possibly the negative of what it was. So I don't really care about that either. A can be a negative constant if I want. So finally, I get the temperature at time t is tm plus a e to the kt. If I know the initial temperature, I can plug that in and get T of 0 is T naught. That has to be Tm plus A e to the 0, which is just Tm plus A. If I know the ambient temperature and the initial temperature, I can find A. That's the solution of the differential equation. But I also need to know K. How am I going to find K? So using, knowing the initial value tells me the constant a, but I also need to find the number k, and that means I'm going to need one more piece of information. So it, altogether I need two pieces of initial data. So typically how this is done is you measure the temperature of the object at two different times, possibly now, time zero, and one minute later. And from that temperature difference, you'll be able to plug in and find k, and then find the temperature as a function of t. So that's what we'll do in this next example here. The thermometer is taken from an inside room to the outside. Outside the temperature is negative 15 Celsius. Must be in Canada or somewhere. After one minute, the thermometer reads 13. And after five minutes, it reads minus one. What was the initial temperature of the inside room? So there's a little twist here in this one because they're not telling the initial temperature. They're telling you the ambient temperature, negative 15. They're telling you the temperature after one minute, it's 13. And they're telling you the temperature after five minutes, it's negative one. And what you want is the initial temperature, T of zero. So that's slightly different. They're telling you the values of t at 1 and 5, but not at 0. But we know from the previous slide that the temperature at time t is, what was the solution? Tm plus a e to the kt. So I can take that solution, plug in my two pieces of data t equals 1, I get 13 equals negative 15 plus a e to the k. So that gives me 28 equals a e to the k. And at t equals 5, I get negative 1 equals negative 15 plus a e to the 5k. At 15, I get 14 equals a e to the 5k. So now, from my two pieces of data, I've got two equations and two unknowns. Now, they're nonlinear equations because of that exponential function in there, so I need to be a little bit careful when I'm solving them. Um, but it's not too bad. What's the best way to do that? Let's, um, if I see they're both proportional to a. So if I just take the second equation and divide by the first equation, 
I get 14 divided by 28, well that's a half, is going to be a e to the 5k over a e to the k. So the a's cancel. This simplifies to be e to the 4k. Well, that is e to the k to the power 4. So e to the k must be a half to the power quarter. Now, if you wanted to, you could actually uh, just take logs of both sides, and that would tell you what k is equal to. It's equal to a quarter log a half. Log half is negative 0.69, so that is a negative number. But we don't actually need that here. So now I've got the I've got the value of e to the k. So I can plug back into this first equation here, and that tells me what a is. It's 28 divided by e to the k, so that's 28 divided by a half to the power quarter. Or 28 times 2 to the 1 quarter. Now, where are we? We found e to the k, we found a, so we know everything. Come back to the solution here. Read the question, it says, what was the initial temperature? That means I want to know t of 0. So I plug in those values. t of 0 is going to be tm plus a e to the k times 0. tm was negative 15. a was 28 times 2 to the 1 quarter e to the 0. Well, e to the 0 is 1, so I can forget about that factor. So I get negative 15 plus 28 times 2 to the 1 quarter. I get out my calculator, and that comes out to be 18.3 degrees. I could also sketch the graph of the solution, now that I know exactly what it is. Hang on, that's not going to work, is it? Because I need negative numbers. Let's try that again. Here's negative 15. That's the ambient temperature. Here's positive 15. The initial, the temperature after one minute was 13. After five minutes, it was negative one. And now I know that I started at 18.3. It's about there. So it's actually cooling down fairly slowly. Now we know that as t tends to infinity, it's going to tend to the ambient temperature. You can see that from the solution as well. Here it is here. K is negative. So as time gets larger and larger, this exponential is tending to zero. Temperatures tending to the ambient temperature. So my solution is going to look something like this. It never actually reaches the ambient temperature. It cools down more and more slowly because the temperature difference is getting less and less. Okay, now, in the second example, it will be a nonlinear differential equation. It's a very important model of population growth which improves and adapts the Malthus model. Rate of change of population with respect to time is p times a minus bp. a and b are going to be positive constants. And they depend on which environment you're modeling. p is population. And the feature of the Malthus model that we saw earlier, which was dp dt equals some constant times p, just the rate of growth of population is proportional to the current population, that predicts exponential growth. Now, in reality, if it was, uh, for example, some fish living in a lake or something, the population cannot grow without limit. It must have, there will be some natural maximum carrying capacity in the environment. And the way this model deals with that is by saying that the natural rate of increase, the A thing here, is not a constant, but decreases as the population increases. 
So here we see here the A minus BP is the rate relative rate of increase. And you see that when big P is small, it's approximately equal to A. As P gets bigger, the rate, the rate of growth gets less and less, and it will eventually go negative. This equation has a uh, fixed point or steady state. Actually, it's got two. It's got P equals zero and P equals A over B. So I can study this equation qualitatively already. There's one fixed point at P equals zero. That means if your population is zero, it stays there. There's another one at A over B, which is called the carrying capacity of the environment. And if my initial population is in between, it will increase exponentially for a while, but then the rate of increase will slow down and the population will tend towards the carrying capacity. If my initial population is greater than the carrying capacity, then dpdt would be negative and my population will decrease towards the carrying capacity. And although this is a simple model, it has been found to, um, to work very well in some situations in ecology. So, we want to solve this differential equation and it's non-linear because of the p times p there on the right hand side. But it is separable. So that means I have to move all of these all of these p's. This entire right hand side has to be moved to the left. And I have to do that by dividing by that to, to leave one on the right hand side. So I'm going to divide both sides by p a minus bp. So I get one over p a minus bp dp is equal to dt. It's just one times dt left. So integrating the right hand side, that would be very easy. It would just be t plus c. The left hand side is the challenging bit. How do I integrate this function here? It's one divided by a quadratic function of p. That would be a little bit difficult if you hadn't, didn't know what the method was to use. The method to use is partial fractions. That's a rational function. One polynomial over another polynomial is called a rational function, and they can be integrated with partial fractions. So again, this may well be something that you need to uh, go back and brush up on. Okay, so first I have to do the partial fractions, and then I have to integrate. So copy that out first, 1 over p a minus b p. Fortunately, the denominator there is already factored, so it's going to be something over p plus something over a minus b p. Add up the right hand side, I get big A, A minus B, P, plus big B times P. Matching the numerators, I get 1 is equal to A, A minus B, P, plus B, P. Expand the right hand side, I get a constant term, plus a P term. So I get that on the constant term, I get big A times little a is 1. So A must be, big A must be 1 over the constant A. And the coefficient of big P should be 0. So this thing here should be 0. So I get um, B is equal to A times little b. So I get 1 over P, A minus B, P is equal to 1 over a times 1 over p plus b over a minus b p. There we go. I've done the partial fractions. This one looks a little bit more complicated than normal because I've got these parameters little a and little b coming along for the right here. Now, where was I? Oh yeah, 
we have to integrate that. So I've got, I'm going to run out of space, aren't I? Okay, that. So I'll move that A onto the left. Sorry, move, move the multiply through by A and integrate the left. I get log of absolute value of P minus log of absolute value of A minus BP is equal to AT plus constant. Collect the logs log absolute value of P divided by A minus BP is equal to AT plus C. And now I have to solve for big P. Take exponentials of both sides and solve for P and you get P of T is equal to little a times a constant. Actually, I know I don't want to call that big A. Call it, it's going to be e to the c divided by little b times e to the c plus e to the minus a t. We could call that a times a constant d over b times d plus e to the minus a t. Where d is equal to e to the c. So I get a formula, it's a fairly complicated formula, but it is more than what I had before, because before I was just sketching the approximate shape of the solutions. So if I wanted to do some data fitting, for example, to some observations, that wouldn't help, I'd need to know the actual formula for that solution. And now I've got it. There's the solution of the logistic equation. Now we're going to plug some numbers in. I'm going to solve the logistic equation. Well, I've already done that. I don't need to do it again. When I know the initial value is, initial population is 500. The population after one year is 1,000. And the carrying capacity is 500, uh, 50,000. So I know that A over B is 50,000. So that means that A is 50,000 B. If I take my earlier solution and um, work out the constant of integration based on the initial population, I'm going to get P of T is equal to A times P of 0 divided by B times P of 0 plus a minus b times p of 0 times e to the minus a t. Make that guy a little bit longer. Now I know I'm going to substitute in a is 50,000 b and substitute in for p of 0. And I'm going to substitute also t equals 1, p equals 1,000. That will let me get the last constant I need to know, which is uh, B. So I get 1000 is equal to 50,000 B, sorry about all the numbers, times 500, which is P of 0, divided by 500 B, plus 50,000 B minus 500b e to the minus a. Now here a very nice thing happens. Every single term there has a common factor b. So the b's will cancel. So this is equal to 50,000 times 500 divided by 500 plus 50,000 minus 500, that's 49,500 e to the minus a. Now I need to do a little bit more work solving that equation to get e to the a. I'll skip that step and we'll just go straight to the answer. 
population at time t is 50,000 divided by 1 plus 99 times 49 over 99 to the power t. So I get an explicit formula for the population at time t. And notice that as t gets larger and larger, this number 49 over 99, that's about a half. If it's being raised to a larger and larger power, that whole term there is tending to zero. So I get that the limit as t tends to infinity of p of t is just 50,000 divided by 1. It's 50,000, which is the carrying capacity. Okay, so that was a little bit more complicated, some tricky numbers in there, but the, the principle um, stands if it's a an equation that we know how to solve, in this case linear or separable first order, and you have some situation that's described by that, we can solve the equation, plug in the initial data, and get the exact solution.